Hagrid and the Seven Thresholds by Barbara Purdom, host of Quantum Harry the Podcast. Before Harry Potter overcomes the seven obstacles to the Philosopher's Stone, each of which is a distillation of one of the seven books in the series, he must cross seven thresholds, six of which foreshadow the following books, but all of which are collectively emblematic of the first, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, itself a threshold to a world of magic and mystery. Joseph Campbell describes liminal heroes crossing into other realms, penetrating barriers between real and numinous worlds. Harry's liminality is twofold. He matures throughout the series, by definition a liminal process, when one is no longer a child but not yet an adult, straddling the threshold between childhood and adulthood. He also repeatedly penetrates world barriers as an axis mundi, a link between worlds. He crosses the seven thresholds in the first book thanks to Hagrid, the series' chief threshold guardian. Despite his nominal job being the Hogwarts groundskeeper, Hagrid has another more esoteric title, Keeper of the Keys, also a title for St. Peter, who keeps the keys to heaven. Hagrid fits neatly into Campbell's hero cycle as the herald of Harry's adventure when he brings him his Hogwarts letter, but is a key himself, a talisman for Harry, when Harry crosses thresholds many times in the seven-book series. Hagrid even carries what he thinks is Harry's dead body out of the forest in the seventh book. He metaphorically takes him away from heaven, from death, another threshold. As chief threshold guardian, this is fitting. It is also a Pietà moment, reminiscent of many depictions of the Virgin Mary holding the body of the crucified Christ. This is just one clue that Hagrid embodies the mother archetype. He is one of many archetypal mothers Harry has. Campbell identifies a variety of mother types. The absent, unattainable mother is Lily, though she has an excellent alibi. The hampering, forbidding mother describes Petunia, who tries to stop Harry from simply being himself. The repressive mother is Dolores Umbridge, and the desired but forbidden mother, represented in Greek myth by Eucasta, mother of Oedipus, is Cho Chang. Harry's good mothers are Hermione Granger, Molly Weasley, and Hagrid. They care for him, feed him, and are often seen knitting or weaving, like Lachesis, the mother figure in the Trio of the Fates. Needles on magical autopilot, Molly knits Weasley jumpers, Hermione knits hats for her virtual children, house elves, and Hagrid knits while traveling with Harry to Diagon Alley, as well as other times. When it comes to archetypes, gender is as irrelevant as age. Hagrid's actions are what make him an archetypal mother, a role he repeatedly plays. Hagrid also mothers creatures other than Harry. He calls himself Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback's mummy, with no trace of irony. Norbert is later called Norberta. Her gender is not set in stone. Hagrid seems determined to be the mother to Norberta and to his brother Grop that his own mother was not. The author repeatedly insisting on calling Hagrid a father figure to Harry might have clued us in about her issues with seeing past surface appearances when it comes to gender, even that of her own creation. Hagrid is male but never plays an archetypal father. The nurturing he provides to Harry, to his brother, and to his menagerie of interesting creatures is always motherly in nature, perfectly in step with other archetypal mothers. Threshold number one. Hagrid first plays an archetypal mother to Harry when he quote-unquote delivers baby Harry to number four Privet Drive on Sirius Black's enchanted motorbike, a symbolic echo of birth. Throughout the series, Harry has symbolic rebirths, surviving what ought to have killed him, or crossing thresholds between worlds, often traversing a body of water to do so, symbolizing the waters of the womb. To bring Harry to Surrey from Godric's Hollow in the West Country, Hagrid flies over Bristol Channel, a symbolic womb water threshold to go from a region home to many wizard families, including Dumbledore's, Bagshots, and Weasley's, to Harry's muggle relatives. Harry's godfather contributes the transportation, further marking this as a baptism, when godparents are appointed, and a symbolic rebirth, as all baptisms are. In myth and folklore, even cardinal directions carry symbolism. Traveling into the West is symbolically dying. 
traveling toward the sunrise rather than the sunset, symbolizes new life and rebirth. Thus, the link between the first book and the first threshold is clear. Hagrid takes Harry from west to east, from death, his parents' deaths, and what was supposed to be his death, to new life. He is reborn as a muggle after a symbolic baptism. Flying over water with the archetypal mother, Hagrid. Threshold number two. The second threshold Harry crosses with Hagrid again involves water. He delivers Harry's Hogwarts letter to the hut on the rock. Hagrid crosses water to reach Harry, and Harry must cross water with him to leave again. This signals another symbolic rebirth. The link between this threshold and the second book is that Hagrid is delivering a letter to Harry, a piece of writing. In the second book, Chamber of Secrets, Ginny Weasley writes in Tom Riddle's diary, setting the entire plot in motion. In both cases, a piece of writing opens up a new world, though neither is without its dangers. Harry's school letter takes him over a threshold of understanding. He learns that he is a wizard. He can now put odd childhood events into context, put himself into context. He has a corresponding spiritual coming of age in Chamber of Secrets. After fearing that he is the heir of Slytherin due to his parcel tongue ability, he uses this ability for good to enter the chamber, where he makes a statement of faith in Dumbledore, the god figure, bringing Fox the Phoenix to him, a symbolic Holy Spirit. Because he speaks in a different language and expresses faith in Dumbledore, followed by a symbolic Holy Spirit appearing, this is his metaphorical confirmation or bar mitzvah, which also involves speaking in a non-quotidian language. After this, he slays the basilisk, destroys the diary, and saves Ginny. He learns who he is through his Hogwarts letter in the first book, and at the end of the second, he gains a new self-knowledge. His beliefs and his choices make him who he is, not his abilities. Threshold number three. Early in the third Harry Potter book, Harry accidentally hails the night bus, taking him to the Leaky Cauldron, where Cornelius Fudge, Minister for Magic, tells him he can stay at the pub for the rest of the summer, rather than returning to Privet Drive, where his name is less than mud after blowing up his Aunt Marge. Harry now sees Diagon Alley out his window each morning. He eats ice cream while doing his summer homework. He gazes rapturously at the new firebolt broom in the window of quality Quidditch supplies. He lives in the magical world once more, without being a guest in a wizarding home or at Hogwarts. This is one reason that the third threshold Harry crosses with Hagrid in the first book is linked to Prisoner of Azkaban. The third threshold is Hagrid taking him through the wall of the Leaky Cauldron to Diagon Alley. Hagrid's knowledge of which bricks to tap is needed to breach the wall, to create a threshold, and then cross it. Hagrid is the key. Harry's captivity in the first book, Living with the Dursleys, and Sirius's captivity in Azkaban have the same cause, Voldemort murdering Harry's parents. The third book's climax, Harry helping Sirius to essentially walk through a wall to freedom, is another link to the third threshold, when Hagrid accompanies Harry as he re-enters the wizarding world after ten years. Hagrid also helps to give Sirius his freedom, thanks to his hippogriff Buckbeak, on whose back Sirius escapes ministry custody. Threshold number four. In a third-year divination lesson, Ron jokingly predicts that Harry will receive, quote, a windfall, unexpected gold. Harry does receive a windfall early in the next book, when Ron gives him gold that leprechauns threw to spectators at the Quidditch World Cup to pay Harry back for the omnioculars he generously bought for him. Ron learns, however, that the gold evaporates sometime after he gives it to Harry. Ron's off-handed prediction could refer to a more permanent type of gold, though linking the fourth book to the fourth threshold that Harry crosses with Hagrid. That threshold is Hagrid taking Harry to Gringotts Bank, where the keeper of the keys produces a literal key so that Harry can withdraw gold from his underground bank vault, one of many symbolic underworlds in the first book. It is a fitting place for Harry to acquire gold left to him by his dead parents. In Goblet of Fire, he goes to another symbolic underworld, the graveyard at Little Hangleton. Upon returning, he is declared the winner of the Triwizard Tournament, receiving a thousand gold galleons. 
In the graveyard, he also sees the shades of his parents, who left him the gold in his vault. Another link between Harry's first trip to Gringotts and the fourth book is that on the day he and Hagrid are at the bank, Professor Quirrell is also there to steal the Philosopher's Stone on Voldemort's behalf. In Goblet of Fire, another defense against the Dark Arts teacher, Marty Crouch Jr., disguised as Mad-Eye Moody, wants to steal Harry to use as a human Philosopher's Stone. Harry's blood, like the red Philosopher's Stone, is used in the spell-slash-ritual-slash-potion that resurrects Voldemort. One of alchemy's goals is converting base metals, such as lead, into gold. Lead is toxic. When present in a body in large concentrations, it is fatal. Alchemists linked death and transformation to lead, and it is the base metal they were most interested in transforming into gold. Thus, Harry the Human Philosopher's Stone turns lead slash death, his trip to the graveyard, into gold when he receives the prize of a thousand gold galleons, an echo of his first trip to the symbolic underworld of the bank, where he finds gold from his late parents. Threshold number five. The fifth threshold Harry crosses with Hagrid's help is another water crossing. All first-year students undergo this rite of passage when Hagrid leads them across the lake in small boats, yet another symbolic baptism. Baptism is one of the major sacraments of Christianity, and this symbolic baptism, as a threshold, is linked to the metaphorical religious war rocking the wizarding world in the fifth book of the series, Order of the Phoenix, the Harry Potter version of the 1605 gunpowder plot, a church-state conflict in which Hogwarts is the symbolic church taken over by the government to reinforce belief in its new dogma just as the crown took over the church in England when Henry VIII wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Before entering the symbolic state church, all students are symbolically baptized. The title of the fifth book also includes Phoenix, a nod to the only phoenix in the series sharing a name with Guy Fox, a central figure in the gunpowder plot. Harry undergoes an analogous rebirth in Order of the Phoenix, whose title refers to rebirth in general, which a phoenix symbolizes. At the beginning of his fifth year, Harry is reborn as someone no longer blind to Thestrals, which transport students to the castle after their first year. These creatures draw carriages Harry once thought moved via a magic spell or charm. However, having now witnessed death up close, Cedric's death, a reenactment of his father's death, he is symbolically reborn with a new ability seeing Thestrals, as all magical British 11-year-olds are reborn as Hogwarts students by crossing the lake. After a symbolic death and rebirth, their eyes are open to the wonders of Hogwarts. Harry loses Sirius Black in the fifth book, his godfather, central to a baptism, which is what the fifth threshold is. Luna Lovegood helps Harry to view Sirius's death not as an end, but a temporary separation, preparing him to remove his invisibility cloak in the final book and greet death as an old friend. Threshold number six. When Harry crosses the sixth threshold with Hagrid, he is also with Draco Malfoy, Neville Longbottom, and Hermione. This threshold is the detention in the Forbidden Forest, another symbolic underworld. Draco is reluctant to enter the forest and threatens to complain to his father. In the sixth book, Half-Blood Prince, Voldemort punishes Draco for his father's screw-up at the Ministry in the previous book by ordering him to kill Dumbledore. Instead of Draco hoping that his father will save him from a punishment, he is punished because of his father. Hagrid tasks the students with tracking down a unicorn after he finds its blood in the forest, evidently from a severe wound. Unicorn blood keeps a person alive even when on the brink of death, and the sixth book, aligned with this threshold, focuses on potions, poisons, and near-death encounters. Among them, the poisoned mead Draco sends to Dumbledore that almost kills Ron, the love potion and the chocolates that Romil the Vane gives to Harry, the potion that Dumbledore drinks in the cave where he and Harry go horcrux hunting, and Harry cursing Draco in a boy's bathroom. Snape, the potions master in previous books, now the defense against the dark arts teacher, saves Draco, and indirectly saves Ron through the marginalia in his old potions text, which is how Harry knows what to do to prevent Ron being poisoned. 
ron is not included in the detention in the first book while he is recovering from a dragon bite and he is sidelined for a while in the sixth book while he recovers from the poisoned mead sent to dumbledore by draco whose name means dragon the wounded unicorn staggers around the forest it is a long slow death like dumbledore's which occurs throughout half-blood prince from the cursed ring horcrux whose effects are temporarily arrested by snape however the curse is still slowly killing dumbledore his given name albus means white in latin and the feminine form of albus alba also happens to be the scottish gaelic name for scotland where hogwarts is located the unicorn is the national animal of scotland hagrid fears that he may need to put the wounded unicorn out of its misery which dumbledore asks snape to do for him in the sixth book hagrid has never known a unicorn to be hurt also linking it to dumbledore the only one voldemort ever feared draco and harry are both present when snape kills dumbledore and together they discover the dead unicorn in the forest quirrell is largely responsible it is through him that voldemort can drink the unicorn's blood when a defense against the dark arts teacher kills dumbledore in the sixth book it echoes a defense against the dark arts teacher killing the unicorn a symbolic dumbledore in the first following the detention when harry is going to bed his lost invisibility cloak is returned to him with a note saying just in case dumbledore gives harry what he needs to protect the philosopher's stone without him just as he prepares harry in the sixth book to defeat voldemort by destroying the remaining horcruxes without him Threshold number seven. Harry, Ron, and Hermione want to defend the Philosopher's Stone from Snape, though the real enemy turns out to be Quirrell, host to what remains of Voldemort after he failed to murder the infant Harry over a decade earlier. Near the end of the first book, Hagrid slips and tells them that music pacifies Fluffy, the three-headed dog guarding the entrance to the area of the castle where the Philosopher's Stone is hidden. This is the final key that lets them enter the Forbidden Chamber. As an obstacle to the Philosopher's Stone, Fluffy aligns with the first book because, like Hagrid, Fluffy is a threshold guardian, barring entrance to a symbolic underworld, while Cerberus, the three-headed dog in Greek mythology, guards the threshold of a literal, though mythical, underworld, the realm of the dead. Fluffy is almost another Janus figure, like Quirrell, who has Voldemort coming out of the back of his head. We can imagine one of Fluffy's heads looking back to the Seven Thresholds, one looking forward to the obstacles, and the middle one representing something like midnight on New Year's Eve, a liminal moment, a threshold, both an ending and a beginning. At the moment that Fluffy is the first obstacle that Harry and his friends conquer, he is also the seventh threshold that Harry crosses. As a threshold, Fluffy aligns with the seventh book, because once Harry and his friends cross this threshold, they are in new territory, completely dedicated to thwarting Voldemort, which they do throughout the seventh book. In Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, they leap blindly into an abyss, leaving the familiar world of lessons, homework, and school clubs behind. The stakes are no longer the marks on essays or exams, winning at Quidditch, or making a perfect potion during a lesson. The stakes are life and death. They first do this when they drop through the trapdoor guarded by Fluffy, crossing this threshold into the unknown, but only after Hagrid the Threshold Guardian gives them the key. In the seventh book, Harry, Ron, and Hermione begin their horcrux hunt in earnest when they flee Bill and Fleur's wedding reception, a threshold for Ron's brother and sister-in-law, the beginning of their new life together. Harry and his best friends thus go from a threshold event that includes music, which pacifies Fluffy, to the fight of their lives, leaping into the unknown. Thus we see that examining the relationship between the seven books and the seven thresholds that Harry crosses with Hagrid's help in the first book illuminates various plot points in each book, inducing us to return to Harry's world again and again, to tap the bricks, to traverse the lake, to enter the forest, to leap the trapdoor to cross a magical threshold.